Hi, I'm Ben Llewellyn and I'm looking today at Wales and Scotland, not what makes them similar or the same, but what makes them different. In this four part series, I'll be looking at Wales and Scotland's identities through their languages and how radically different they are. I'll show you how since at least the Ice Age, Wales and Scotland's landscapes have formed in contrast. We will see how separate legal systems created different modern democracies. And we will delve into the Renaissance in which Wales and Scotland took journeys which could not be further apart. If you're new here, why not subscribe so you can catch the entire series. And if you leave a like, I'd really appreciate it. If you're just coming into the series in this episode, here's a link to my last episode here. The Renaissance, in my view, is the most defining factor is what makes Wales and Scotland so different. It's really a story of what happens when you go through a period of immense social and cultural expansion on the one hand with national institutions and on the other hand without national institutions and the ways that these two nations went into the beginning of the Renaissance was very different. Scotland in the 14th century had emerged victorious in wars of independence, firmly establishing itself as an independent kingdom. When the Renaissance really ushered in in the 15th century, it had national institutions and its kings were able to project royal power and emulate the Greek and Roman learning that the Renaissance projected as the imperial monarch to be celebrated in art and work and to patron architects, poets and painters. An independent Scotland having aligned with France gave it additional input from the Renaissance coming from the continent through which its thinkers went to study in France and brought back these ideas. Wales, on the other hand, had just emerged from the longest war of its history. A 16 year long failed national war of independence in which guerrilla tactics were used for over a decade. Many ecclesiastical institutions were burned to the ground like this one in Carter's Butte Park. It lost countless treasures and manuscripts. Centers of learning were utterly destroyed. The economy was in sheer economic ruin. It was a country covered in ash and ill-suited to enter any period of profound social, cultural, and political change. During this period of the Renaissance, the ideas which became liberalism were first formed. And it's so crucial that we understand this because later on, Thinkers like John Locke and Burke would inherit these ideas. Wales never developed these ideas in that time and it's been lacking for it ever since because it didn't have that Renaissance period that was so bright in terms of individualistic thought and then carrying on later into the Enlightenment. It was in this period in Scotland that its classical universities were founded, St Andrews. Glasgow, Aberdeen, and later on, the University of Edinburgh grew out of colleges there. Wales, by contrast, had no universities. It had people who had to go out into England, into Oxford and Cambridge in order to have an education, and many of these people never came back. A lot of those in Scotland, however, whilst they had to do upper degrees in some of the English universities, they had centers of academic learning in which they could hone their skills and economic value in their own country. And this furthered a cultural expansion within Scotland to a degree that we just didn't see in Wales. Scottish monarchs promoted literature. James IV promoted poets like Gavin Douglas, who harked back to ancient Greece for inspiration and translated Greek works 
into a Scottish version of English and this genuinely promoted Scotland as a renaissance monarchy capable of competing with its neighbours. It also produced great poets like William Stewart were changing their meters, moving them forward. Welsh poetry was still echoing that of the medieval poets of David of Gwilym in their Cynhaneth form. It was really constricted because it did not have the courts of its kings. What it did have that Scotland didn't was this unbroken tradition and it kept evolving during this period. Perhaps the most profound difference in terms of what Wales had, something which Scotland did not, was that it promoted and ushered in a new age of learning in a, in a native non-English language. Because they didn't have their royal courts and universities, many of the thinkers of the Welsh Renaissance turned toward ensuring their language was going to survive and they made great effort to create dictionaries, prose, works of literature in the Welsh language to be able to teach people through the medium of Welsh and their greatest achievement by far was they got a Bible in their own language which was a remarkable feat at the time. Wales was the first stateless nation in the world to have a Bible in its own language. Creating a Bible during this period was no easy task. You had to have people who knew Hebrew and Greek and then have it translate directly from those languages into Welsh without having to go through English. So you had people who went to the universities in Oxford and Cambridge and they came back to Wales after learning these other languages and translated the works of the Bible from the Old Greek and Hebrew directly in to Welsh. And this has ensured that Welsh has survived in ways that languages like Cornish and Irish and many Native American languages simply did not and could not imagine having at this point in history. It was a great, immense work during the Renaissance. Architecturally, Wales and Scotland were the inverse, frankly. Scotland rejected the Tudorian style in favour of a Romanesque and later French influences via Italy. Wales actually combined these Renaissance works with their own native Tudor style, which they expanded into England, projecting their own cultural worth via architecture, which wasn't quite done in Scotland. You have places like Plas Mawr and Conway, which are which exemplify this new Tudorian sleek minimal style, vaguely influenced by Renaissance architects from the continent, the era of the great stately home. It didn't have palaces, but what it could do is construct these grand middle nobility estates. And it was a very prosperous time for a period. The era of the Glendora Revolt had faded and they entered in a new period in which they opened up their homes and created stained glass, very beautiful buildings. Scotland being a kingdom, built palaces. Many of these Scottish palaces directly imitated Italian styles. You have many buildings around Edinburgh which imitated this style. It was a period of mass building in Scotland and relative stability, although there was a lot of religious tumultuousness. Although Wales wasn't able to produce classical frescoes and new renaissance great vaulted ceiling paintings as you see in Scotland and new additions to beautiful places like St Giles as I mentioned previously in the section on law. It did however manage to have quite a beautiful array of paintings and chapels which although the reformation took many of those away here is a selection of a few of them, quite an expression of a unique, very specific culture that didn't really exist just in Scotland. It's a different country. So from art and literature to 
education and identity and culture, the Renaissance had a very deep and lasting impact upon Wales and Scotland, which is reflected in two very different journeys, two very different peoples that really resonates deeply down the centuries to today because Scotland had these institutions and these great buildings amassed during this period that gives it a sense of being a very, very distinct nation apart from England. And Wales was focused more on the survival of its country at that period in history, the survival of its native culture, the survival of having even any kind of religious tradition of its own, and especially its language. So the two are very distinct and both worth delving into and both poignant and important when considering just how different these two nations are. The, these are not nations on the same journey as we've seen throughout this series. These are nations on a completely different trajectory with a different history, with a different idea of what it means to be Scottish and Welsh. And I hope that continues. These are very different countries. One thing we need to do both in Wales and Scotland is to stop looking at our fellow countries as though it's some type of fantasized, romanticized Celtic brotherhood. It's, it's not, as we've seen throughout this series. It's, it's much more complicated than that. Scotland has a, a very woven Anglo-Celtic identity with different percentages of influence from each, as does Wales. If you liked this series and want to learn more about any specific part of it, I'd be very happy to hear from you and to discuss that with you. Thank you.